Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name's Liz. I'm with the Chicago Bruseum. Um, I'm going to just get some things started out here today, but um, as always, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we like to think of this space as a community space, a bar, if you will. Uh, today it's a cantina, and um, the chat room is where we're doing all of our bar chatter um, and banter. Share whatever you'd like. Uh, we always like to talk about what we're drinking. Um, I am drinking. Uh, michelada, uh, which is a beer, beer. Uh, with um, a tomato-based uh, concoction called sangrita that is something that you usually chase tequila with. Um, so uh, it's nice to mix it sort of like a, a Bloody Mary, but with um, out the vodka and just beer. Uh, quite refreshing. Anyway, um, so yeah, chat away in the chat room, uh, share information, ask questions. Uh, I'm going to hand this over to Cesario in a minute and then just ask any of your questions um, in the chat room and we'll get to them toward the end. Um, we're going to mute you all uh, so that we can focus on Cesario's presentation and that's kind of it. Um, but again, thanks again for joining us. I'm excited for this today. Um, I've known Cesario, um, gosh, since mm. for a long time. Um, when I uh, used to be at the Chicago History Museum, uh, we worked on uh, an exhibition um, about Abraham Lincoln, and then we coupled it with an exhibition about Benito Juarez, and Benito Juarez plays a, a key role in our conversation today. And so uh, I met Cesario, who advised us on that project, and we even got to travel to Mexico City together. Um, so that was a lot of fun, and so I'm a big fan of his, I'm a big fan of the National Museum of Mexican Art, great colleagues over there, so um, I'm glad that Cesario uh, was able to say yes to my request to be our guest today for uh, Cinco de Mayo, which um, being a, a Mexican-American woman, um, uh, definitely have very strong ties to, um, but it's certainly a, a day that is incredibly misunderstood. Uh, so again, excited for Cesario, who is uh, uh, just incredibly knowledgeable um, about all things Mexico and Mexican history, for sure, and art, uh, to do this for us today. So with that, I'll stop uh, chatting and hand it over to Cesario. All right. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, yeah, you know, I'm going to take the mask off. I just thought it was uh, um, appropriate to wear it in the beginning. And as you can see, there's I'm in the main gallery of the uh, National Museum of Mexican Art here in Chicago in Pilsen. And one of our prize pieces that we have on display is a bronze bust of Benito Juarez, uh, also sporting a lovely uh, a mask today uh, for the occasion. And um, the, other, the other work of art, I'm gonna take this off now. The other work of art that we have uh, around the corner is the painting that um, I'm assuming everybody can see it. It's called La Batalla de Puebla, uh, and it's by an artist named Alejandro Romero, uh, originally from Tabasco, uh, Mexico, and but he's been in Chicago now working for more years than, than he was in Mexico. Um, and it's funny because it is around this time of the year that we usually get uh, phone calls, questions, a lot of reporters, uh, coming by and asking uh, about Cinco de Mayo and appropriate ways of celebrating it. Um, um, and then, of course, I, I need to, to explain to them what exactly it is before we can talk about how to celebrate it. Um, Cinco de Mayo is really a very complex story uh, until, you, until you break it up and look at it historically, and then you realize it's kind of a real simple uh, um, idea, right? It's, it's a battle. It was a battle that they won uh, in a very long war. So what I would like to do today is uh, take the next, uh, next few minutes, half an hour, um, to just kind of talk about the, the Cinco de Mayo Batalla de Puebla uh, and dispel some of the myths, but really take a look at, you know, what it is and, and perhaps uh, why is it so darn popular? in the United States, uh, more so than it is in, in Mexico. Um, so, so we'll start with the, the, the idea of, of the battle. And of course, it's important to understand who's, who's at war here. Um, let me see, there we go. So 
this is just a, 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 not that Abraham Lincoln had anything to do with uh, the Batalla de Puebla or not that Benito had anything to do with um, the Civil War, but they were presidents around the same time and there was a connection um, and they, they were two men who really understood one another. Uh, and in a lot of ways, they were truly products of their time, uh, but they were both very unique. They were, they were men who, who stood up to a situation, um, an incredible situation. And if you look at their backgrounds, perhaps did not have as much training uh, as you would think that somebody would need uh, during the war, uh, during the, the wars that they were, that they fought. Um, you know, there, there was um, a, a uh, um, sort of a, a mis uh, uh, comisario from, from Benito Juarez. He, he would have, he was down in um, Springfield, Illinois, and his whole thing was meeting with the Secretary of State at the time and keeping Mexico on the, the thoughts of the United States, right? Um, and let's explain the reason why and what they were actually up against. Um, so Mexico had a civil war before the United States um, Civil War. Uh, and it was the, 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 it's now been called the War of Reforma, the Reform War. And it's a very uh, uh, complicated time because essentially there are conservatives who are the wealthy uh, class and they're fighting the liberals who were more uh, the individuals who wanted change, right? They wanted separation of church and state. Uh, they, they thought that a, a democracy and, and, and uh, a republic, a federal government would be the best way to do things with a constitution. Uh, and Benito Juarez was part of, of that team. Um, so the civil war in Mexico raged on and at the end of that civil war, the liberals with Benito Juarez uh, were victorious. And the, the conservatives, and by the way, conservative is, is the name of the party, right? It's, I'm not talking about um, a, a philosophy, right? I'm talking about a party like Democrats and Republicans. And uh, so there were the liberals and the conservatives. And so the conservatives did not want to uh, change, right? They had, they, they owned a lot of land. They were well to do. And, and so change was something that, um, that they did not uh, embrace. Um, so what happened is Mexico was broke. After the Civil War, uh, Benito Juarez basically had a broken, poor government, uh, didn't have any money. And so one of the first things he had to do uh, as president of, of, of Mexico is to cancel all debt payments. And so that meant no more payments to Spain, to France, to England. Um, and of course, those countries did not really take well to this. And so um, all three of those countries came to Mexico and Benito, was, Benito Juarez was able to negotiate with both Spain and England and, and uh, it probably had a, a payment plan or some kind of a, of a plan uh, where they would, they would get paid after the fact. Uh, but France really thought that they would take this opportunity. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte III, not to be confused with the, the original uh, Napoleon, um, Napoleon Bonaparte III thought that this would be a very opportune time to, to perhaps start a new colony in, in the Americas, and uh, he had his eye on Mexico. So he sent over troops, and at this time, the, um, the, the, the French forces that, that traveled some 4,000 miles to the port of Veracruz in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, they, they were on top of the world. They were quite the, the armed forces. Um, they, were, they were someone to be reckoned with, and uh, certainly were able to, to take care of themselves in battle. Um, they landed in, in Veracruz and um, then they started making their way over to Mexico City, which was uh, the capital, is, remains the capital of Mexico. And the idea was to obviously capture the capital. Um, 
on their way over, on their way over to Mexico City, they passed through the city of Puebla. Uh, Puebla at that time was sort of like the second city in Mexico. Um, it, it certainly had a lot of um, uh, riches and um, it was well established. Um, and it was at Puebla where the, the forces of Benito Juarez, um, you know, they've been called ragtag, they've been called, um, uh, they, they weren't trained very well. They're, they certainly were more than a militia, uh, but they, they were no match, right? They were supposed to be no match for the French forces. Uh, well, lo and behold, they actually, uh, they won the, the battle, the battle at Puebla. And uh, of course, that happens on uh, May 5th of 1862 and uh, they beat the odds. And so, and so I guess uh, this, this small, short battle uh, that didn't last too long where, where they, they beat the odds really stood out in Mexican history um, as, as a point in which Mexico decided that they were going to take care of their own country, that they were able to protect their own country. Um, Obviously, the story is much longer than one day. It's much longer than the, the 5th of May, the Cinco de Mayo. Uh, but ultimately, that was their first um, and probably the, the, you could say the, the, the most famous battle victory um, over Napoleon's forces. Um, what it actually did do is uh, it united Mexico. Uh, I think that, that uh, when they realized that they could defeat the most powerful army uh, in the world at that time uh, that, that, you know, they, they, they rallied. And it certainly boosted uh, Benito Juarez, who was the, the president, and uh, it certainly boosted uh, um, his popularity, their morale, and really, you know, it, it went pretty far. Um, the other thing, though, is that Napoleon was not going to give up, and so sending sending more troops, uh, they did eventually start making their way towards Mexico City um, after the after May fifth, after that battle. Um, Benito Juarez was given a lot of power by Congress, uh, and he fled. He left Mexico City, and he essentially ruled the country uh, of Mexico from his carriage, from his cart. Um, and those, those of us who have been able to go to uh, Castillo de Chapultepec and see the cart that's there, uh, it's very, very modest. Uh, it's, it's certainly not extravagant. Uh, uh, it's, it's not meant for show. Um, and to think that this individual was able to run a country as president uh, from different cities and different places all over Mexico is truly an incredible feat. Um, Benito Juarez thought or knew, um, oh, we'll go back to the, this photograph. He knew that, that he could outrun and outlive the French. He knew that, that, that you know, he was there for, he was there for the get-go and the French, he felt, were not going to be able to uh, outlive him in, in Mexico, and, and he was right in the end. Here's, a, here's a, um, an important photograph of an important person who also uh, sort of comes around during this time. It's Porfirio Diaz. Um, young Porfirio Diaz, probably in his, what, 30s at that time, early 30s, um, was a colonel, and uh, he, he definitely uh, showed bravery. He was on Benito Juarez's side, and uh, he, he became uh, well known and respected uh, when he was a colonel. He would later go on to become a general. Um, and he, would, he would command uh, Juarez's forces. Uh, and then we'll see at the end of this conversation, um, um, Porfirio Diaz becomes the president over and over and over again. Uh, many people would call him a dictator. Uh, he certainly had a regime. Uh, in Mexico for three decades. Um, so he was, it was one person who was in charge uh, for a long time. And not to, not to go off on a tangent, but because of the way he treated the poor and the things he, 
he set in motion uh, in Mexico when he was when he was uh, president or dictator for for three decades. Um, because of him, the Mexican Revolution begins uh, in 1910. But that's that's a whole other story. So eventually, Napoleon realizes that the United States, because of the Monroe Doctrine, uh, might not take too kindly to their uh, starting a colony in Mexico. And he didn't, the US had finished its civil war by this time. And he, he knew that he wouldn't be able to do what he originally set out in Mexico. So he sold Mexico uh, to the, the Habsburgs um, and the, the um, one of the Habsburgs, Ferdinand Maximilian, Maximiliano, as he's known in, in, in Mexico, uh, travels to Mexico with his wife, Carlota. Uh, she was Belgian, I believe. Uh, travels to Mexico to assume the role of emperor, emperor of Mexico. The conservatives, uh, they felt that they would rather have an emperor from Europe be in charge of, of Mexico than Benito Juarez with all of his liberal ideas of land reform and separation of church and state and, and uh, all those, those ideals that would have meant that they lose quite a bit of their holdings. Um, so Ferdinand goes to Mexico and uh, I've also seen his, his horse-drawn cart, which is also at the same museum in, in Mexico City, uh, Museo de Chapultepec. Highly recommend it if anybody goes to Mexico City. Uh, beautiful view of the city from up there. And his uh, cart is obviously very French, very ornate. Um, he was there to be the emperor. And, you know, when you read the story of, of uh, Fernando Ferdinand um, and, and you read uh, what he was really thinking at the time, um, you kind of have to feel for the guy. He, he was sort of duped in a way. He, he thought he was going to land in Mexico and be this uh, well-received emperor and start this colony. And a lot of his ideas actually went along with the liberal ideas of Benito Juarez. A lot of the things that he originally wanted to do in Mexico uh, were right on par with, with what Benito Juarez was trying to do. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, he, he, he was not voted in and uh, it was not constitutional. And so Benito Juarez really felt that, uh, like so many in Mexico, that he, he needed to leave. It was an oppressive colonial government coming in. Um, so the story goes on. So, so Cinco de Mayo was the battle. Uh, the war raged on for years. And in the end, Benito Juarez did win out. I'm missing a lot of the exciting stories here, I know, but it's, it, I want you to understand where we're coming from uh, with, with uh, the Cinco de Mayo uh, battle and celebration. So by 1867, um, Napoleon pulled out all his forces and he kind of left Ferdinand Maximiliano high and dry. Uh, nobody there to protect him. And so uh, Benito Juarez's uh, uh, army government moved in, they captured him and, and he was executed. He, the, a lot of people around the world uh, protested uh, and said that Maximilian should not be executed. Uh, um, but Benito Juarez, uh, he pulled out of that decision, they put it in court and, and he, he tried to make it as fair as possible and in the end, uh, yes, uh, Maximilian was executed and Benito Juarez uh, took over as president. Um, on a little side note, um, maybe there won't be too many of these side notes, but on a little side note, um, the French, it's important to understand, uh, really influenced Mexico starting in this time period. Uh, if you recall Porfirio Diaz, um, the, the, the colonel, uh, he actually tried to make Mexico extremely French uh, in many ways, uh, both with the food, the architecture, the clothing. Um, everybody seemed to emulate or want to emulate Paris at the time. Um, this is sort of the end of the history lesson.
so 19, by 1910, um, Porfirio Diaz had been in charge of Mexico, had been a, a powerful dictator in Mexico for three decades. Um, and at the start of the Mexican Revolution, um, Porfirio Diaz took off. He was sent off to exile in Paris. Um, and that's where he spent the rest of, of his years. Uh, he's actually buried in Paris. I forget the name of the, um, the, the very famous uh, cemetery. Um, I was actually there and visited him as well as Jim Morrison, who was also buried there, uh, and, and many other uh, well-known celebrities. I'm sure there'll be a lot of chats coming up uh, with the, the famous people who are buried in that cemetery in Paris. Um, but to this day, uh, tortas, uh, I was reminded the, the, you know, you go to any Mexican restaurant now and you order a torta and that pan bolillo, that bread uh, that, it's, that it's, it's served on, uh, that comes from France. That's one of the French influences still today in Mexico, um, along with a lot of the beautiful buildings that you see uh, in Mexico City and in Puebla. Fast forward. Um, since the 19th century, the, 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 you know, the, the Mexicans in California really uh, embraced this idea of Cinco de Mayo, the La Batalla de Puebla, right? The, the Battle of Puebla is what it was called. Um, and I think, I think one of the main reasons is because it is this sort of um, underdog story. It's, it's the, the, the team that was not supposed to win uh, actually you know, winning uh, at least that battle. And so, and so it is sort of this proud idea. In Puebla City, they do celebrate it. They, in, in Puebla, uh, today I guarantee you there are all kinds of celebrations happening, but you know, it's, it was their backyard. It was, it was uh, it's, it's known as the Batalla de Puebla in, in Mexico. And they are actually very surprised in many parts of Mexico. I get asked quite a bit when I go down there, uh, why is it that they, that they celebrate Cinco de Mayo in the United States. They don't understand it because it's certainly not um, a, a holiday, a major holiday whatsoever in Mexico. Um, and the, the best way I, I can explain it is, is this, well, there's a couple of ways, but you know, what does Mexico celebrate? Mexico celebrates uh, May Day, which just happened four, days ago, five days ago, on May 1st. Um, May Day is a celebration, as I hope many of you know, uh, the celebration or commemoration, I should say, of the Haymarket Square riot that happened here in Chicago. Um, and really so many people around the world have embraced um, hey, uh, May Day as, as the Workers' Day. Um, it's, it's Labor Day for the rest of the world. We celebrate ours in September because we, don't like the, the affiliation of socialist uh, holidays. And so we, we celebrate our Labor Day in September, but the rest of the world celebrates uh, Labor Day on May Day. And that is what Mexico celebrates, something that occurred here in Chicago. And then a few days later, here in Chicago, and in many other cities with Mexican communities, um, we celebrate Cinco de Mayo. Uh, and I think both sides of the border sort of scratch their head and say, well, you know, why do they celebrate that? I don't, I don't get why they're celebrating that uh, when it's something that we don't necessarily celebrate. But one thing that I definitely want to point out too is that, you know, by the 1970s, so after, um, after World War II and the generation that came back and their children who really sort of pushed uh, the ideas of, um, of social justice and civil rights and the Chicano movement, um, they saw Cinco de Mayo uh, as Mexican Americans, they saw Cinco de Mayo as a way to celebrate Mexican heritage, Mexican identity. Uh, and so I think that, that it was the, uh, the Mexican American community here in the US in California and throughout the Southwest and Texas uh, that really started uh, reinterpreting Cinco de Mayo as a uh, cultural heritage celebration, uh, as a time to remember Mexico, um, and as a time to really uh, sort of um, take out all things that are Mexican and 
uh, use them in our homes and in our celebrations. Um, there have, like so many things in, in this country, uh, there has been a commercialization of this, right? It's, it's just, it's, it's part of our capitalist um, society and the way we do things. And so the commercialization of anything, of any celebration, any holiday, uh, oftentimes um, reduces uh, an important event or a sacred event or something that has a lot of reverence. It reduces it to, to a place where more people can participate. And when you take something and you reduce it so that, um, so that, so that the masses, for the, the society can celebrate it, you, you tend to water it down. I mean, there's no other way of saying it. Many, uh, many people don't necessarily understand or, or care to understand the history of it. Um, it ends up being in May. So it's, a, it's springtime is around the corner. Uh, certainly, Mexico is known for its uh, beers and for its food, uh, and so I think it has really taken on sort of a sense of uh, St. Patrick's Day. Um, you know, here in Chicago, we celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day. I've celebrated St. Patrick's Day many, many years um, in on, in the city of Chicago, and when when I was in Ireland or when I've spoken to Irish people um, who are immigrants from Ireland, they have expressed to me that it's a very different kind of celebration back there, that uh, it, things do close. You don't go to work, uh, but you generally attend mass, uh, perhaps say a rosary, you, you, you pray with the family. It, it continues to be sort of a sacred uh, holy day, uh, whereas in the U.S. it really has become something else. And um, and I see a comparison, I guess, with Cinco de Mayo and St. Patrick's Day. Um, sometimes things kind of get a little crazy. And I think um, what happens is that people who don't understand a holiday will gravitate towards it and sort of um, pick and choose symbols that they feel are appropriate. Um, and in doing so, uh, really transform it to, to something that it, it where it doesn't really resemble the original notion. Um, oh, how I don't know how this slide is looking. It looks a little weird on my screen. I hope everybody can see it. Uh, this is from a few years ago. Uh, obviously, uh, Chicago did not get the Olympic bid. Thank goodness. Um, we didn't get the Olympic bid, but, uh, you know, certainly it was a way of embracing the Mexican community, the huge Mexican community in Chicago, uh, and trying to, to um, get everybody excited um, about sports and soccer and the Olympics coming to, to the city. Um, this is my last slide, my last image, uh, where you know even, even uh, Hollywood uh, jumps on it in new and unique ways. Uh, this was also from a few years back when um, when Lucas Films and and I don't think they they own uh, Star Trek Star Wars anymore, um, but um, you know they released their Spanish language version and they tried to tie it in with Cinco de Mayo. So in the end, you kind of have these far-reaching um, ideas where anything that would be in Spanish uh, sometimes has nothing to do with Mexico. Sometimes, you know, whether it's whether it's out in the, the galaxy far, far away, or or sometimes, you know, uh, people think that it's a Latino uh, or Latin X celebration uh, that it is that they don't even realize that it's, it's something unique to Mexico. Um, so, in in conclusion, uh, just want to wrap it up a little bit. Um, in conclusion, you, you, you heard the history, so you, you get the fact that it was a war, uh, I'm sorry, it was a battle uh, that they won and a war that took a long time for them to, to overcome. And so that's the commemoration, that's the celebration. But in the end, it's the Mexican Americans um, in California, Southwest and Texas that truly uh, turn it into a celebration here in the United States. Um, and from there, you know, again, we have all kinds of marketing uh, effects and, and marketing ideas where 
uh, it's, it's springtime, people are itching to go out and uh, Mexican food and beer seems to be one of the, the motivators uh, and, and something that has come to be known uh, along with Cinco de Mayo. Sadly enough, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy about that last part, right? Um, uh, I wouldn't mind people drinking and celebrating if they actually knew uh, the facts and, and what it was. So if you know the facts and you understand what Cinco de Mayo is and what it is not, uh, by all means, salud. Uh, Liz, I think. Thanks, Cesario. Sure. Um, so we wanna make sure that everybody uh, chimes in. This is, this is the virtual cantina after all. Um, use the chat room or unmute yourself and uh, get in on the conversation. I have a few questions, I always have questions. Sure. Um, my questions are going to be geared toward things that I uh, happen to like and mm -hmm. try to uh, study. Um, and that's going to be um, some Mexican heritage things and of course beer and history. Um, but again, people ask questions, uh, share what you're drinking, um, keep, keep chatting. Um, Cesario, I'm wondering if you could go back a little bit to the beginning of the story. Um, for people who might not know about Benito Juarez, his story is quite fascinating um, because he really was in this time of European influence. Benito Juarez is this indigenous man who really sort of comes from nothing and you know has this career as an attorney and ends up being president, which is why we find so many interesting parallels with Abraham Lincoln. Right, right. Right. So if you could just tell us a little bit more about Benito Juarez and sort of the importance and, and the role that he played in Mexican history and culture. Sure. Um, so, so Benito Juarez is just this incredible, and there are a lot of parallels with Abraham Lincoln in the way that he was sort of uh, adopted by society and became part of the popular culture. Um, he, he becomes emblematic uh, and in a way, simplified. So, you know, let's, we, we can't get away from that. It, he, he was, his image was used to, to form a nation. Uh, 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 Porfirio Diaz uses, although he was arch enemies with uh, Benito Juarez by the end of it, um, he uses the image of Benito Juarez to really unite Mexico uh, under his uh, banner. So, Benito Juarez, what we, what we do know uh, of him, and there's, there's quite a bit written about this guy, just like Abraham Lincoln. Um, he was born in Oaxaca. He was uh, born in a very small mountain town. Uh, he was uh, an orphan. He, he, he didn't know his parents. Uh, he skipped, uh, he left town, uh, moved to Oaxaca City, where he was sort of adopted, and he was educated uh, in, in Catholic schools back then. Uh, so he did learn quite a bit. Uh, you know, he, he, people also think later on that he was very anti-religion, that he was, you know, trying to destroy the church. That is far from the true, uh, the truth. He actually went to mass after Cinco de Mayo, after the Batalla de Puebla, he went to mass to give thanks and celebrate. So, um, I don't think he was doing that to, to, for any other reason, but could be, could be Catholic guilt. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Very good. Uh, but the, the th other thing that is very surprising to people about him, um, and so not to, not to go into the whole myth busting uh, around Benito, is that even though he was uh, indigenous from Oaxaca, uh, he did not fully uh, celebrate his indigenous identity. He didn't have an indigenous identity, per se. Uh, he was fully indigenous. Uh, you know, he, he obviously he spoke two languages, he was bilingual, but by the time uh, his, he was educated and then went to law school there, he went to, the, to, to the, one of the prestigious liberal schools in Oaxaca City, which is where he got a lot of his uh, new ideas about what a democracy should be. Um, his religion, his identity was the law. He was all about uh, law and justice and democracy, and so really, uh, you know, he, he has become sort of a symbol of indigeneity in, in many of the murals that you see in Chicago or Los Angeles or Mexico City. Uh, but in fact, um, he, he didn't really identify much as indigenous. Um, the thing that we know about him also is that he was a very uh, noble, honest guy. He did not come, he was the first president to come uh, who was not a military person. He was a civilian 
president. Uh, he didn't come from a rich family that gave him anything. He didn't own a lot of land. He was dirt poor. Uh, he, 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 he was not the typical leader of Mexico. And he's the only one who, who did not profit after his presidency. So there's a lot of incredible things about this man, uh, things that he did, things that he didn't do. Um, but, but certainly like Abraham Lincoln, he has this whole aura of mythology around him uh, and people, people, you know, he's a great, he's a great icon. He's, he's been passed down from generation to generation, but he doesn't, he's not that simple. Sure. Who is? Yeah. Um, so you're saying that when I get, after I get my Abraham Lincoln tattoo, I should get a Benito Juarez tattoo? Without a doubt. You, <laughs> you need to have both of them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> One on each bicep. Uh -huh. um, okay. So another thing, um, a little bit. So that's, I think that's really important to talk about those indigenous, indigenous beginnings, of course. And really, you know, you get the Spaniards coming through in the 1500s and European presence um, before all of this starts in the 1800s. And even in between then, you get another set of Europeans, right? You get Austrians. And this is where I actually like to focus the story because of the beer story, <laughs> right? I'm actually uh, representing, I'm, I'm actually representing Mexico today, but I'm also representing that Austrian sure. uh, presence because um, the Austrian presence plays such an important uh, role in beer production and industry in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to say something about that. You know, I, I won't speak to that uh, specifically. I, uh, um, I'll, I'll stay away from that. But I will. I just want to say this: that oftentimes uh, people's misconception of Mexico is that it's sort of monolithic, that it's you know Spanish and indigenous only, and that is really cutting Mexico short because Mexico has such a global influence. You know, for the the three hundred years that it was under Spanish rule, there were many uh, there were trade routes that went there. From Asia, there were there were uh, enslaved Africans that were brought there uh, to do so much of the work in all parts of Mexico, not just uh, in Veracruz or or on the coasts, uh, but throughout Mexico. Mexico has a very rich tradition that goes from Asia to Africa to Europe, and of course the millions and millions of indigenous people uh, and communities that really. Uh, uh, influenced Mexico in so many ways uh, today. So I, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But Mexico is very complex and global and multicultural. Uh, it's just that, you know, from Chicago, perhaps it doesn't look that way to a lot of people. Um, just, just so that everyone uh, has an idea what I'm talking about in terms of beer. Um, Austrians, of course, making beer, making lagers. And when the Habsburgs uh, head to Mexico, um, they needed a beer. They started making beer, brought in people from Austria, beer makers. And so um, a lot of the beers that you see in Mexico today even uh, are, are really sort of get their origins from this occupation of Austrians in Mexico. And so if you ever heard of a beer called a Negra Modelo or a Dos Equis Amber, um, that's a style of beer called a Vienna Lager. Uh, because it comes from Vienna, Austria. So a lot of interesting connections um, uh, to talk about. We could talk about alcohol for a long time, or at least I could, and history and its connections to uh, culture and, and bringing people together. Mm -hmm. um, but one other thing I actually wanted to, you know what's interesting too is actually listening uh, to you talk and just having this conversation is how you have global influence in Mexico, uh, helping it grow and evolve, and what's interesting to me is how Mexican cuisine, right, mm -hmm. is like sort of one of these mother cuisines and a lot of these, like, it's really, it's really sort of made an impact now of the reverse, yeah. right? It sort of uh, uh, just reaches so many other places in such a very, like, rich cultural way. Yeah. You, you, you know, one of, the, one of the things that you're making me think of is that, you know, uh, we oftentimes describe the United States as a melting pot. Uh, and when in fact it's probably more of a of a mosaic or a, a quilted uh, what's what's the the metaphor that's being used? It's like a, a a quilt, right? That has all the different pieces that are still intact, but making up one beautiful mosaic uh, piece. Mexico is definitely a melting pot. It is there. There are so many uh, ingredients that have reached Mexico, and so many different kinds of recipes and ways of cooking or or making drink or that that Mexico and I'm using the, the the food and drink as as also as a metaphor uh, but culturally speaking Mexico is uh, a melting pot of so many different uh, places and the beautiful thing about Mexico is that it has its, this way 
of taking something foreign, bringing it in, making it their own, uh, changing it a little bit, developing it, evolving it, and voila, it, it, people love it probably because it reminds them of something else or just because it's, it's so well done. Uh, Mexico is a country that truly, truly acculturates and, and makes things theirs uh, in a unique way. Uh, you know, you could even look at the, the, the Catholic religion if, if, if you wanted to and, and talk about how the Catholic religion in Mexico is very different than the Catholic religion in the Vatican. Um, and and it, it's in line with, with, you know, teachings, Catholic Christian teachings, uh, but there's a lot of unique uh, uniqueness in, that goes on in Mexico that is, that is beautiful and it's, it's an honest expression. Uh, won't even go into Day of the Dead, but, you know, that, <laughs> that is, is there's the so many, example. There's so many misunderstood moments. Yeah. Uh, um, hilarious. Um, Cesario, a question in the chat room. Can you sure. highlight some of the visual art motifs of Cinco de Mayo? Uh, so in, in Mexico, you know, Cinco de Mayo is, uh, the Batalla de Puebla is totally uh, central to that city. And Puebla is known for its churches, uh, gorgeous uh, building. There's like a church on every block in Puebla City. Uh, and so a lot of the, the architecture of that place is without a doubt uh, uh, part of the Cinco de Mayo. Also in that area of, of Mexico, uh, you know, whether, whether it's the, the way the women dress or the fashion uh, or the food. Um, Puebla is so well known for Talavera, uh, which is a, the blue on white uh, ceramic uh, influence that, that came from Asia as much as it came from uh, Mayonica in Spain. Um, and, then, and then Mole, Mole Poblano, it, you know, um, it, it, it's sort of like the food of, of that city. And so I guess if, if, if you're talking about icons, uh, Puebla is the first place to look. Um, and, and in the US, I think it's kind of just become all things Mexican. Um, unfortunately, um, it's, it's not known well enough to be specifically a celebration of Puebla or that central area of Mexico. Uh, and so oftentimes, you know, the mariachis from Guadalajara sort of get thrown in there, or some of the dancing and the music from the coast gets thrown in there. So it's it's kind of a hodgepodge in um, in 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 the United States. Um, you know, some of the murals. If people are interested, they could. I'm sure they could look up murals in Mexico that touch on the Batalla de Puebla. You'd probably get a few images that are similar to the one that I started with. Uh, by Alejandro Romero, um, so it's it's you know it's a war, uh, you know cannons and uniforms, all that kind of of imagery, um, and of course uh, uh, Fernando uh, really stood out with his mustache and his beard, uh, and and his introduction of the French uh, culture into Mexico. Um, but yeah, there, there's I I can't think of anything really that stands out as being so unique. Uh, iconographically to uh, Batalla de Puebla or Cinco de Mayo. Um, you, you mentioning all of the sort of war uh, motifs and sort of, you know, depictions, it's sort of just to play devil's advocate a little bit, it, it sort of doesn't now surprise me as much that people think it's Mexican Independence Day. Right. Sometimes, right, because right. lots of what we think about here in the United States is, is war and and freedom and, and, and such. Sure. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest with you. I think, I think in the United States, uh, we're, we're not, we don't have a great reputation for understanding and knowing world history. Uh, and so even Latin America, you know, oftentimes uh, people confuse uh, stories and regions in Latin America and sort of think that, that everyone who speaks Spanish or comes from Latin America uh, has kind of like a similar historic uh, uh, line. And that's, that's so far from the truth. I mean, it's, it's, you know, whether it's the Caribbean or whether it's the tip of South America, whether it's uh, the influence uh, in the Andes uh, from the Inca or up in the North from, from uh, uh, in Mexico, uh, all the different cultures and regions were, were all very, very different. But yes, I could see how 
people would sort of assume that it has to do with Mexican independence. So it's having, the way, having, September. <laughs> yeah. having said that, um, you know, what, what needs to happen for all of that to change for, for people to sort of get a little bit more yeah. in touch with some of these specific dates yeah. and understand their meaning? Well, you know, I, I can't help but think that uh, chats and conversations like this is certainly a, a, a start. Um, I think if, if people are really uh, curious about a celebration, you know, the, the best way to, to learn about it is through somebody who, who knows about it, someone who, who is come, an immigrant who has come from that place, uh, or just looking into it. I, I really wish more people would learn about Benito Juarez, um, especially uh, Mexican Americans who, who, who really, I think, have a different understanding of, of what he did or who he was. Uh, I, I think understanding Benito Juarez, it's, it's a complicated story, but I think understanding it is, is certainly step one uh, to understanding whether it's, whether it's the Batalla de Puebla or, or uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe in December or whatever it may be. Yeah, I've always, um, again, sort of going back to that guy, Lincoln, I've always found a good hook that way, right? Because it's an easy, it's an easy moment, it's an easy mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. You know, the synapses fire for a lot of people in the United States with Lincoln. So I kind of, you know, go that route and say, well, you got, you want to learn about this guy, right? Because sure. he's sure. sort of uh, uh, along those lines to get him in there. Um, all right, everybody, this is your last chance to ask a question because um, I don't have any more questions. The only thing I will say is uh, at least we don't have a term like the Shirish. For, for, for these things. <laughs> that, that one is one of those that is just ridiculous to me. Um, so you, uh, you've been at the museum today. Yes, uh, at the National Museum of Mexican Art. I'm so sorry if I did not say that earlier. Uh, National Museum of Mexican Art, uh, we had a visit from uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, which hopefully everyone will be able to see online at some point soon. Um, she came and I, I think she was definitely impressed with all the work that we do here, whether it's exhibitions by contemporary artists, uh, displays of ancient artifacts that tell our history, uh, artwork and exhibits by uh, young teens, uh, Yolokali out in a little village. Uh, we've got a wonderful exhibit up right now, I wish you could see it, uh, called Woven. It's uh, an exhibit by five women artists who use fiber art and textiles from Mexico, the U.S., and Georgina Valverde from here in, in Chicago. We do a lot of things here at the museum, uh, different age groups, uh, uh, different. We, we have our queer prom coming up for the teenagers uh, in the LGBTQ community and uh, just a lot of great stuff. I can't wait till we open our doors and everybody can come back in and celebrate and learn a little bit uh, and have fun here in, in, in this incredible neighborhood that uh, certainly has great watering holes where you can go and, and uh, quench your thirst. Yeah, I mean, you guys are really kind of the best deal in town. It's free to get in, right? There's always some, some really fascinating uh, exhibitions that um, have a great like sort of a mix of, of history, art, culture. Um, and you're, I gotta say, this might sound silly but your uh um store is really ah, fantastic <laughs> yeah yeah yep it's it's a great place to get a very unique gift for uh, a wedding or a special occasion without a doubt yeah um okay before we go one last question because i think actually it's pretty important um okay. i've heard this before too uh from eric he wants to know if uh latino latina or latinx what's the perspective on that What's your perspective? And actually, for any if any uh, other uh, Latinos in the uh, chat, yeah, yeah. what's your perspective on that too? Because I want to know. Yeah. So so the, the yin and yang, like like with everything, right? Um, uh, I am I am super excited that our young generation uh, is proud enough about their heritage that they're actually uh, finding a new term to identify with. Uh, that is very open and uh, accepting, and, uh, and so so I, you know you, you can't frown on that. I mean that it's 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 about passion. It's about being proud of who you are and your identity. Uh, on the downside of that is that it tends to sort of uh, um, mix up all the different uh, Latino Latina groups. In other words, 
uh, I'm, you know, I'm very proud of my Mexican heritage, of my Mexican culture, of being Mexican. Um, and I would in, rather introduce myself as uh, a Mexican born in Chicago uh, than as a Latinx, because I feel that it sort of erases some of the, the uh, pride and the identities that I have in Mexico. And, and, you know, and everybody should be proud of where they come from. Uh, um, and so, and so it kind of erases the specialness in a way by, by sort of uh, putting everybody together. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if, if that's what the next generation chooses to uh, call themselves, you know, who, who am I to say that it, it's right. wrong or, or right. that they shouldn't? Oh, oh, those damn labels. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, Cesario, thank you so much. You're very for welcome. For joining us today. Everybody in the cantina over in the chat room, thank you for joining us. Um, we've been doing these events since mid March, since all of this craziness started. Um, Tuesday, uh, we're doing another one. Uh, excited to have a chat with Julia Hers, who is the craft beer program director for the Brewers Association. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of craft beer, what's happening now, and what's, what might happen next after. Um, after COVID. Um, website is the best place to learn about what we're doing. And if you have the ability and are able uh, to do so, today is Giving Tuesday. Um, please consider a donation to the Bruseum and to the National Museum of Mexican Art or to any uh, nonprofit organizations because especially in the arts, uh, they're going to need your help uh, quite a bit. Um, but thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Society will have a great rest of your uh, evening. I hope there's a drink involved. Oh, you know it, you know it. And salud, <laughs> which, is the way, which is the way in Mexico we say cheers. Uh, it also means health. So these days, uh, wishing somebody health and salud uh, has a double meaning, and it's always, always important, right? Salud. All in that. Salud, everybody. Good night. I wish I had a drink, but I'm in a museum gallery. <laughs> That's a no-no. Thank you. Thank you.